Hello and welcome to C++ Weekly. I'm your host, Jason Turner. I am available for code reviews, contracting, and on-site training. If you follow me on Twitter, you will have noticed that, um, well, by the time this airs, about two weeks ago, I promised that there would be a bunch of episodes and material coming up on C++ 20 now. And that is the beginning of what I am doing here. We are just getting to the point where compilers are starting to support C++ 20 features. And you can see here on CVP reference that they are listed as C++ 2A. What we know is that this will be the first release in the 2020 time frame, but we don't exactly know when the standard will actually be published because there's no way to see in the future. But the general goal is that it will be C++ 20 because the standards committee is on a every three year release cycle and we've had 11, 14, 17, and 20 would be the next thing that would be coming up. So in this episode, I am going to cover designated initializers. This is one of the features that was added in C++ 20. I will demonstrate what that is, how you can use it, and why some people are particularly excited about it. So you can see here in Compiler Explorer, now I am running my own local build again, and I have a latest trunk build of GCC because at the moment GCC has the most C++ 20 features implemented. And if you look at my command line here, it's important to note that I am in fact compiling with dash std equals C++2A. Now, many compilers have supported this as a language extension for a while, and this is also something that C, that is, has supported for a while, but it is just now getting official C++ support. So I have my struct here, and if I wanted to, in my main, I can create an object of type S, and I can do this initialization like this. And this is direct initialization of the members of the struct, and this is something that we've been able to do um, at least since C++ 11, since we got uniform initialization syntax, this braced initialization that we are looking at here. But in C++ 20 or C++ 2A, but we will just call it 20 for the sake of these videos, we can specify that we want to initialize the i value here as 1. And if we do that, then we are forced to designate that the second value is the f. Now, if we wanted to do this, we can. We can do a default initialization of the second member. And if we wanted to add a third element like this, then we can skip the initialization of the middle member, the f. We are getting warnings from the compiler here saying missing initializer for member s colon colon f, and that is absolutely true. We did not specify an initializer for it. Now, a couple of questions that we might have is, how does this work with our default initializers? So let's just do an in-class initialization here. And if we do this, we can say that the default value of f is 3.4, and we can only initialize i and d here, and we are no longer getting any kind of warning from the compiler about skipping over f, because this, being a built-in type, normally would not have an initializer by default. So, for clarity, if this were one of my classes, I would ask, what is the value of f right here? And the answer is unknown. It is, um, it is undefined behavior to access the value for f because it is a built-in type that doesn't have any sort of initializer. If we do this, it is going to be a value of 0, and the compiler is intelligently warning us about these things. Now, one of the things that we have going on here is... If we were to give a regular constructor like this, and we were to use our member initializer list, and we were to do something like d is 1.0 and i is 2.0, uh, no, sorry, i is 2. Now, we're going to get a warning here from the compiler, and most compilers now will warn on this for us, saying that D will be initialized after I. And this is always true in C++. It is something that you can rely on, that the 
values are going to be initialized in the order that they are declared. So I will always be initialized before f, f will always be initialized before d, and d will always be initialized last in this code. So we are initializing these out of order. Now let's bring that back to our designated initializers that are being added in C++ 20. If we wanted to rearrange these, this will actually fail to compile. This is now a requirement in C++ 20 if we use these designated initializers that we get this designator order for field s colon colon i does not match declaration order in s. So C++ 20 is going to enforce this initialization order to match the order of declaration. So we go back to these values. Now at the intro of this video I said there's one reason why a lot of people are excited about this. The obvious first thing is that this gives us a little bit more meaning to our braced initialization, direct initialization of our members, and perhaps makes us think in more cases we don't necessarily need constructors because we can do something that's actually quite readable here and have the names and the types of the things pretty obvious. But one use case that I have seen a few people mention that I would like to point out is effectively the ability to do named parameters. So let's change this struct s to be called parameters. And we will add a function that takes an object of type parameters. And it doesn't really matter what we do with it here. Uh, in fact, let's not even give it a body. Let's just declare the function. And now we can call this function use parameters, and we can do something like this. And this effectively gives us named parameters. Now, the question that you may be asking is because we're using this braced initialization syntax, can we leave off the type altogether? Because the compiler knows full well what type we are trying to instantiate right here. And let's go ahead and try that and see what happens. And in fact, we can. So this could be a very interesting way of providing named parameters in a pretty efficient way for the users of your library. Now keep in mind that the values will be owned by this parameters object here, and you're going to have questions about lifetime if you want to use some. If we had some other non-trivial thing that was stored in our parameter list here, do we need to move it? Do we care about copies? Do we care about the lifetime of the thing? But with these Trivial types say you are just passing around ints or floats or you are doing something in your graphics programming 2D library or something like this. This could be a really efficient, clean way of, of keeping your parameters straight and naming them and being able to pass them around. So uh, thank you for watching this first episode in an upcoming series on C++ 20 features. I believe this is the second C++ 20 feature that I have covered on C++ Weekly so far. And thanks for watching. Um, give this video a thumbs up and follow me on Twitter.